Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Leech Collector. This job truly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a person who is responsible for the collection of leeches. The little blood suckers were a popular treatment back in medieval times when just bleeding was a common treatment for a variety of ailments. Headache? Just bleed a bit. Common cold? Have I got a solution for you? Bloodletting, especially by way of leech, was actually used medicinally for thousands of years with possible ties to ancient Egypt. This medical treatment, however, of course, required leeches, which meant that someone needed to collect them. Many leech collectors were people who didn't have a lot of money, and more commonly, women. The job required wading in the water and searching for leeches, and how do you catch them? With your legs, of course. Leech collectors would wait for leeches to latch onto them, and normally would have to wait for about 20 minutes before before pulling them off because they were easier to remove after getting fat with blood. How horrible. This already sounds awful, but what's worse is that after being bitten by a leech, the wounds tend to bleed more than a normal cut even would. This was great to get more leeches interested, but bad as a human who was trying to keep blood inside of their body. This job usually led to those who did it to contract illnesses from the leeches, their open wounds, or just have severe blood loss because at the time, people didn't know you could overdo it with bloodletting this way. In our Number 9 spot today we have the fuller. Wool is a clothing staple. It's been used for centuries, but back in medieval times there was a disgusting part of the job that thankfully doesn't exist anymore thanks to the invention of modern chemistry. Wool is naturally waterproof due to the fact that it contains oils that have been distributed from the sheep's skin. And these oils are what made the entire harvesting, carding, spinning, and weaving processes possible in these times. This is all fine and well, but the trouble comes in after all of that because the cloth at the end of it all was coarse and easily frayed. And this is where the job of a fuller came in. They were tasked with removing the oil from the cloth. Okay, a little alkaline solution, no problem, right? Well, yeah. Except for in these times, the most accessible and cheap alkaline solution was stale urine. Yep, just a bunch of old pee. A fuller had to take this new woven material, put it into a tub full of old pee from who knows where, and then you stomp on it with your feet. And then you get no shower at the end of it either. What's a carpenter without his tool belt, right? What I mean is that fullers were also responsible for collecting their own pee to use for the wool. So they often needed to head to all the local public toilets and private homes to collect it. Just gets worse. In our number 8 spot today we have the Groom of the Stool. This job doesn't sound too bad with just the title, it weirdly sounds kind of regal. I mean it was quite a prestigious position during this time, but it also was one of the most humiliating jobs in history. In the medieval times, kings were looked on almost as if they were gods, you know it's their divine right. And because of this divine right, for centuries it was deemed improper for a king to wipe his own behind after using the facilities. This is where the Groom of the Stool comes in, this high level noble men would be responsible for fetching the toilet chair for the king when nature called, and he would also be in charge of the wiping aspect of the whole thing. No bidets, I guess, back then. The groom of the stool also played a role in monitoring the king's health, as he was tasked with examining the stool just to watch for any serious changes. And should the king be having some digestive troubles at any point, the groom of the stool would always be nearby and ready to administer a royal enema. In our number 7 spot today we have the nightman. This is definitely one of the the shittiest jobs from the medieval times, and I mean that quite literally. Also referred to as gong farmers, these people had the unfortunate job of cleaning out all of the human waste from the cesspits in the castle walls, which they would then transport to a pre-arranged location where it would be buried. These cesspits were the medieval equivalent to a septic tank, and they were usually located on the lowest level of the castle. The nightmen would end up digging through weeks, months, just sometimes even years of disgustingness, and they were motivated to gather as much as possible possible considering the fact that they were paid by the ton. Imagine, that's a frightening amount of work. The job was also quite hazardous, too. I mean, if we really think about what exactly they are doing, it quickly becomes clear that many of them died from disease, and there was also a good chunk of people who suffocated on the job as well. In our number 6 spot today, we have a sin eater. Okay, this is definitely one of the strangest jobs on this list. The job of a sin eater was to, well, eat sins. To do this, they were tasked with eating a piece of bread that had been placed on the chest of someone who had died. Definitely not an ideal day of work for me personally. The idea behind this was that in consuming the bread, they were consuming the sins of that person so that they could carry on into the afterlife peacefully. Basically, sin eaters were willing to sacrifice their own souls and their own eternal happiness just to make some money while they were alive. I'm not sure what's worse, taking the risk with the sins or eating bread from off of a dead person. 
person. No, both bad. In our number five spot today, we have the executioner. We have all heard of this job before. After all, an important aspect of the medieval times was the fact that they were trying to have better criminal law enforcement, which naturally meant that a ton of people were getting executed for their crimes. Well, there is, of course, now the stereotype of people who did this work as being these huge, hooded, evil people. History shows that this stereotype is largely untrue. Most of the people who fell into this job didn't come into it because they wanted to. In fact, most people, of course, saw this job as being undesirable, but the job usually was bestowed upon them. Sometimes butchers were called for the job because of relevant experience. Other times it was criminals who could either do the job or face their own death sentence. And most commonly, people found themselves in the job because their fathers had been executioners before them. Aside from the nitty gritty of the job, I mean the horrors of the work itself, it's obvious. Another part of being an executioner that sucked was the fact that people didn't really want to associate with you. Executioners were usually on the fringes of society and outcast, sometimes even forced to actually live on the edge of town. In our number four spot today, we have cat gut. Back in the medieval times, they didn't have the technology we have now, or even the technology that was available in the 17th century when it came to making strings for instruments such as the violin, but they still did have violins around, so how? Well, in comes the invention of cat gut, which thankfully is not made of cat guts, but it is made of sheep's guts. Okay, really had you in the first half there. Violin string makers during this time would make the strings by basically twisting strands of sheep innards together. Their job would require them to butcher the animal in a very careful way, making sure not to rupture the stomach or the lower intestines. The process could take hours just to get the required materials from the animal. The insides then needed to be soaked in a wood ash solution for a good cleaning, but they needed to be monitored at all times to ensure that they weren't beginning to spoil, which is horrible. From here, the drying process began, and after that, it was time for twisting. In our number three spot today, we have the rat catcher. Another job that really is just what it sounds like. Rat catchers had quite a busy time during the medieval times. There was a rat problem, and these rats were filthy and full of disease, and someone needed to catch them. Castles were often filled with extra grain, vegetables, and herbs in the case of emergency, and this led to the perfect environment for rats and mice. Even before the connection were drawn between rats and disease, people hated them, and this is because they would eat your food. A bad rat infestation for a person without much actually could have been a death sentence for them during this time. This meant that people really appreciated rat catchers in society, although the job wasn't a great one, was clearly risky, and also was largely ineffective. Rat catchers would sometimes try and use spells, sometimes they would use herbs as a sort of poison, and sometimes they'd even use the good old leave the body as a warning to the the other rats trick. Yeah, wonder why it didn't work. In our number two spot today, we have the treadmill operator. This is a job that sucked during the medieval times because it was boring. It's basically like a human hamster wheel, but also because it was incredibly dangerous and not for those who were afraid of heights. Treadmill operators would normally be placed at the highest point of a structure, and the wheel they were stepping on was the top half of like a pulley system to help things be hoisted up as they were building said, you know, structure that they're at the top of. This is a practice that started in ancient Rome and was reintroduced in the Middle Ages. This was actually a job that was commonly given to people who were blind because the fear of heights dissuaded a lot of people from doing this job, which only makes it probably more dangerous. In our number one spot today, we have the lime burner. Lime mortar has been a common and important building material for years, stemming back to the first century BC, but despite its importance, it's not exactly easy to work with. In order to use it, you need to remove the carbon monoxide from the calcium rich stone and this was the job of a lime burner. They needed to take the stone and heat it in a kiln at around 800 degrees Celsius. Sounds easy enough for sure, except for the fact that the job meant that you were constantly being exposed to rooms full of carbon monoxide and dust chalk that was capable of removing your ability to breathe. And also, just to top it all off, there's also a high risk that once the stone was done heating, it might also explode if it comes into contact with water. So. Better hope none of your sweat drips down onto it or else things are not good. With scalps so oily they could star in grease, it's no wonder lice was everywhere. You know what? I will give them a little bit more credit. It is true, after a certain point of not using shampoo, even the straightest of thin hair can regulate its oil levels. So their scalps probably weren't the worst, but maybe they were rocking some hella dandruff. Also, as I mentioned, lice. Say you're somehow living a medieval life healthily, being whatever you are in the castle. You're making a living, you're not sick, and nobody wants to tie you to a chair and dunk you underwater. Even if you've managed that, 
You still have lice. Bugs were everywhere, man. All kinds of them. On you, in your room, in your food. Nowhere was safe. Lice was such a way of life that people treated appointments to get deloused in pretty much the same way people treat appointments for a haircut today. Maybe an exaggeration, but you get what I mean. People in the Middle Ages and medieval times took lice to their grave, living a life of itch, 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 itch. No one likes having rats and mice in their house. Unfortunately for castle dwellers, the dark, cold living quarters within the castle afforded the perfect breeding ground and lifestyle for plenty of rodents and bugs, carrying diseases that could have meant the end for any of the castle's residents. Name something grosser than a non-ventilated stone behemoth full of unwashed bodies. So why no washy-washy of the body body? Why is that so difficult to accomplish? Jump in a river or something, right? Wrong. Leeches, disease, death. Also, hot baths are preferred. Regular and incredibly convenient bathing as we know it today did not exist in Europe until the late 19th century, so Europeans in the 13th, 14th, and 15th hundreds were not vibing with that idea. Firstly, water was precious, especially during sieges, and the work was so hard and manual and labor intensive that you would build up a sweat the moment you got out of the bathtub. So bathing was seen as a waste of time. I mean, wash off two weeks worth of grime and one little batch of sweat made that a waste. Your bath water is probably brown, dude. Still seems kind of worth it. But secondly, the trouble of setting up a bath just didn't seem to be worth it. No running water. So if you wanted a hot bath, you had to boil the water yourself over a fire, carry hot water buckets upstairs to the bathtub, fill the bathtub and not spill the hot water on yourself, get the temperature right, put the soap in if you had any, get in, wash before it cooled, get out, dry, put your clothes back on, and then you have to bail out the entire bathtub by hand with a bucket and find a window to toss the water out of onto some unsuspecting servant. So yeah, it was a lot of work. And what of feces? What do these highly civil highly sanitary individuals have to offer us for the call of nature. The modern toilet didn't exist back in the 14th century. Instead, you either had a closed stool, which was a special seat with a bucket underneath, or you used a privy, which is a seat with a hole in it. So why not call them the same thing? Whatever, medieval people. Waste going through the closed stool, which by the way is where we get the feces nickname stool, was collected in the bucket, which was then removed, emptied, washed, and replaced. Waste that passed through the seat of a privy, which was was the early kind of toilet ended up in one of two places. If the castle had a moat around it, the waste probably would have gone in there. If it didn't have a moat, or if the privy was located somewhere without access to water, bodily waste ended up in a cesspit at the very bottom of the castle. But anyways, check out what some of the privies looked like. From what I gathered reading, there really were some castles without designated rooms for these. Just could find them in random hallways in case you want to whip it out and take a leak right there. At Paravrail Castle, you often find privies high up in the wall, high above the smell, and safe from attackers who might use the literal crap hole to get into the castle like a reverse Shawshank escape. The most famous example of this allegedly took place during the siege of Chateau Galliard in 1204. Talk about a crappy job, it's the royal bleep shoveler. You know the word, it rhymes. So, cesspit, the medieval crap dungeon thing. Though medieval people didn't know about germs, they believed bad smells caused illnesses, meaning when the stank started wafting up a little too hard, one unfortunate man would have to clean it out. Like rich people now, Nowadays, scheduling a maid, whenever this dude showed up, everyone in the castle would hightail it out so as to not have to interact. The gong farmer would shovel the poop into baskets and wheelbarrows and take it off to bury or spread on fields as fertilizer for the food they ate. Gong farming could be dangerous. In 1325, Richard the Raker fell into a cesspit and drowned. Say goodbye to sinus and sense of smell as the acids cook that out of you and stay away from the infectious bacteria literally everywhere. However, gong farmers were quite well paid despite people not wanting to ever get close to them due to their smell. Rest assured though, because castle logic was that closets and toilets are one of the same. The private castle privy was always sharing the same space as the residents stowed away personal belongings and a room called garter robes. Obviously, you can see this is a stepping stone to a wardrobe being a sequestered small offshoot room. Inside the garter robe was also a toilet hole next to your Sunday best. Logic dictated clothes should be kept close to the toilet to to prevent insects 
from damaging them. The idea being that the odor would act as a deterrent for insects. Fecal odor. Okay. And what makes all of this so much better is that you never have a second alone. If you haven't caught onto the theme here yet, it is plain and simple. Castle life meant cramped quarters. It took a lot of people to keep a castle running. There were cooks, cleaners, guards, personal servants, and of course all the royalty as well. Plus, the royals that lived in the castle extended past the nuclear family. It was their extended families as well. As a result, most of the rooms were multifunctional and the keep was the primary living space in the castle. Soldiers, servants, and even lords and ladies in waiting were expected to sleep in groups segregated by the sexes. For example, the women may have slept in bedchambers while the male servants, courtiers, and soldiers may have slept in the great hall. Even lords and ladies of castles often shared a room with a servant of the same sex. So why is that gross? Religious and royal obligation to reproduce. Also people without an obligation who would really like to do it anyway. As long as those people are married, you actually couldn't complain. In fact, it's weirder if you saw something and said something. So if everything stinks and you got next to no windows, how do you make a minty fresh castle? The simple answer is they didn't. Mold, insect, vermin, and disease were all part of everyday life in medieval times. Fresh water was precious and a reliable disinfectant was yet to be discovered. Eating a little bit of mold on your food or stepping in rooms with moldy walls were minor problems compared to actually finding enough food to eat and fighting off hungry wild animals like wolves or not dying of the plague or not being accused of witchcraft, there's bigger fish to fry. People in Norman and Tudor England lived short lives. If you reached the age of 40, you were considered old. Castles were very difficult to keep clean. There was no running water, so even simple washing tasks meant carrying lots of bucketfuls of water from a well or a stream. Few people had the luxury of being able to bathe regularly. The community back then was generally more tolerant of smell as a result. Inside the castle walls, floor coverings consisted of straw rushes and later sweet-smelling herbs like lavender and mint. This could be swept away and replaced when it was of a noticeable point of filth. It was said that an ancient collection of beer, grease, fragments, bones, spittle, excrement of dogs and cats, and everything that is nasty was seen when the soiled herbs were swept up and exchanged for fresh ones. But you know what doesn't help a castle? The smell of rotting corpses. Ah, luxury. There are heads of enemies cooking in the sun on spikes right outside your fresh air slit. There's the remains of a peasant shredded by mad dogs in the courtyard below, and someone is literally rotting just to your left in the wall. Castles were riddled with the dead. In the case of an oubliette, they were quite literally riddled. An oubliette is basically a little coffin cave thing dug into a wall, where a particularly hated prisoner could be tossed in, bricked up, and completely forgotten about. Fittingly, oubliette comes from the French word oublier, which means to forget. Given some of the other medieval death options, I guess starving to death bricked into a rat infested hole wasn't the worst way to go. It's it still was way creepier to think that on any given day a castle had people rotting in its figurative basements and walls. Must have been for great ghost stories though, not great for the smell of their decomposing body quite literally wafting up through the floorboards later. Next up is how horrible it would have been to be a lady on the rack. So ladies have periods and they need some way to handle the men's seas mess without the feminine hygiene products we have today. This ain't the Victorian era where it was commonplace to weirdly free bleed everywhere. Medieval women preferred one of two choices. She could always catch the flow after it left her body or find a way to absorb it internally. In our modern words, medieval women could use a makeshift pad or a makeshift tampon. Pads were made of a scrap fabric or rag, thus the whole on the rag thing. Cotton was preferred because the material absorbs fluid better than the alternative wood, which not only repels liquid, but it's itchy and uncomfortable. Whether they made the choice of a homemade pad or homemade tampon, medieval women worried about leaks and stains. This is the main reason why red was a popular medieval petticoat color. The scarlet color was not only fashionable and decorative, but functional to disguise leaks. Now, the period ain't what's gross. It never is. It's what wealthy castle dwelling women could afford to block said period that was gross. A common type of bog moss found throughout medieval England, Sophagun simifibulolian, was a remarkably absorbent material. Ladies stuffed their homemade pads and tampons with it, and folks even used it as toilet paper or as battlefield dressing. The popular name name for this moss is blood moss. Entomologists contend that this moniker comes from its use in battlefield first aid. This account of course oozes heroism and masculinity. In reality, it earned the name from being used in menses and shoved up there. And definitely my favorite on the list today is protection wasn't just armor. One of the most interesting castle finds includes the protection discovered in Dudley Castle in 
in 1885. Dating from the early 1600s, they're the earliest definitive physical evidence of the use of animal membrane jimmy hats in post medieval Europe. The enact deposits uncovered during excavations contained both domestic and organic remains of the occupying royalists who defended the castle under siege between 1642 and 1646. The keeps latrines had been sealed during the demolition of the castle's defenses in 1647. Examining further, scientists were able to determine that five blackened jimmy hats had been used, and a further five non-blackened ones were presumably unused, all folded in on one another. The Department of Scientific Research at the British Museum boasts that their significance was magnified due to the nature of the find and the extraordinary archaeological cir circumstances in which they were found. Who might have used them is unknown, however the complexity of the manufacture must have made them relatively expensive, so perhaps the preserve of an officer class. It's known that officers' wives were present during the royalist occupation, however this discovery definitely testifies this was neither the time nor place to pop out a kid. Stay safe and use protection y'all. Number 10. Starting off strong with Animal Court. That's right. In the Middle Ages, apparently, it was a regular thing that animals would be put on trial. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil. Of course they were. Of course. And to let them go unpunished would give the devil the permission to take over human affairs. You don't want that. So they would be put on trial. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, all have a history of being put on trial. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation, so needless to say, they weren't well liked. And they were appointed a lawyer, what kind of lawyer back then? No idea. And given great dignity in court, though the verdict was not favorable. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. How exactly they enforced this? Who knows? An anywhere wedding, number nine. Apparently, back in the Middle Ages, shotgun weddings were like the thing. It was the to do. One must simply exchange a sincere vow for another, or not even sincere. It could be like, you wanna get married? Yeah, cool, awesome. And two people could be married. Considering the hot blood of the youth, this could happen anywhere, even after they had already done the deed. Therefore, keeping track of who was married to who got pretty confusing. So then the church finally decided to make marriage a holy sacrament which must be observed by God but not only God the families had to make sure the ceremony was official all the way to the wedding night very often the bride would be carried to the marriage bed by the family who would then stay to view the consummation of the union that's right the tickly boo the boo boo the jiggy that yeah, yeah that's right your parents your in-laws would wait until they saw you get jiggy with it. Number eight, the dancing plague. Not as much of a tradition, but an event that almost became one. When I first learned about the dancing plague, I was speechless and hopefully you will be too. Keep in mind the Middle Ages weren't colorless, but there were some pretty bleak times. Doctors debate whether this event was caused by bacteria in rye that can cause hallucinations like LSD, but no one can really be sure. It just kind of happened and it's well documented. All people people know is that in Strasbourg in July of 1518, a woman named Frau Trafia started dancing in the street and by the end of the week 40 people joined in and by the end of the month 400 people joined in. It was nuts. It was like a massive never ending rave. Initially physicians thought folks were just stressed out so they even brought in professional dancers and musicians to like encourage the joyousness but then people started dying from heart attacks and fatigue. So by that point they were like we better cut this off and so they whisked everyone off to uh, the mountaintop to pray and apparently that prayed the dancing away. Number seven, men's fashion. I may be making a big statement here, but considering men's fashion has been variations of the tux for over two centuries now, kind of, eh, that's a stretch. This may be one of, if not the most colorful periods of men's fashion. Men got pretty risky when with their attire, like you're kind of impressed. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Doesn't sound too crazy yet, but wait. Cod pieces were in and tunics got shorter so they could see their front manhood. Also, very long shoes were a big thing. Uh, the longer the shoes, the richer you appeared and the more pronounced the cod piece. Well, I think you 
I think you get the picture. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with a whalebone. They also adorned wide brim hats, felt caps, and hoods to protect their eyes during extreme weather. Number six, sexy and hairless. Women, on the other hand, had some even stranger qualifiers for beauty. Uh, while today having a thick and bold soap brow and a full head of hair is the ideal, it was the exact opposite for women in the Middle Ages. We have literally almost tried <laughs> everything, and I fear what happens next. Like women's fashion, we just we've done a lot of stuff. Anyways, in the Middle Ages, a woman's forehead was considered the sexiest part of their face. Why? No idea. Maybe because her breath was so bad, it was better to kiss her forehead. Who knows? But either way, it was a big deal. So what women used to do to draw attention to it was pluck their eyebrows, hairline, and ashes away to make sure it highlighted that part of their face. So at very often, they would just have no eyelashes, no eyebrows, and like their hair would be like this far back. Number five, Feast of Fools. The Feast of Fools was a very popular festival in the Middle Ages where everything turned topsy turvy. On January 1st, specifically in France, they would elect a mock bishop or pope, and low and high officials would change places. Kind of like an adaptation of the pagan celebration of Saturnalia, which we talked about in another video. Find it and post it below. People would wear hideous masks to conceal themselves from the festivities so they could behave fully in the activities. There would be parades throughout the city featuring drinking, singing, men would dress as women and vice versa, along with the general mischief. Even priests and clergy would be seen wearing masks during office hours and dance as women, panders, or minstrels. It was officially banned in the 15th century because it got too ridiculous and you know the piety of the people were like, this is a sin. But despite the ban, it still continued into the 16th century. It seems like a pretty hard party to imagine, especially considering how pious they were back then. Priests dancing in women's clothes? Crazy. I mean, technically they're already wearing kind of dresses, their long tunics. Number four, bloodletting. Along with traditions, there were certain medical practices that medieval physicians swore by. The most popular being bloodletting. Got a headache? Bloodletting. Have a flesh wound? Bloodletting. The plague? Hmm. Bloodletting. Emotions? Uh, maybe a little bit of bloodletting. It is exactly as it sounds. They would either make cuts to let the blood drip, or more usually, place leeches on the skin. The rationale behind bloodletting, though, is really important. It was related to the belief in the four basic humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. This translated to the four basic elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Being ill meant something was off with the humors. And therefore, relieving an excess of humor was necessary. Therefore, if there was an excess of blood, it would be removed by bloodletting. If it was bile, they would purge it. Uh, blood was declared the dominant humor by Galen of Pergamum way back in 200 AD. So bloodletting became the most popular. This tradition even lasted beyond the Middle Ages into the 18th century. In the 1800s, the French went through 40 million leeches a year, uh, and also things started to get weird when George Washington was bloodlet when he had got, fell sick with a cold, he died that way, it was a lot. Number three, here lies the heart. As you can expect, death was everywhere in the Middle Ages. I probably, I wouldn't have made it past the age of four. I had tonsillitis too many times. That's probably true for most of us. Making it past child rearing years for women was outstanding. For men, you'd be lucky if you made it past 30. Tough times. So it only makes sense we talk about some of their unusual funeral rites. There were many superstitions around burials, fear of disease, and even vampirism determined what would happen to the body. Eastern Europeans would stake bodies through the heart in order to keep them from returning. Especially if they had taken their own life, they would have to be beheaded. When a village was cursed by plague, drought, flooding, or something other, they would dig up the bodies to investigate, sometimes burning them because they thought, ooh, wow, what's happening? Their nails are retracting, they must be a vampire. During plague time, the normal burial methods were abandoned and they had to resort to mass graves. But on the battlefield, there was actually a very sweet tradition. If a loved one died on the field and the body could not be transported back, the heart would be removed instead. It would either be kept in a box of ivory with spices or buried somewhere. Number two, the mystery plays. If you weren't busy trying to avoid the Black Dead, then you might have attended something called a mystery play. Mystery plays were a sequence of performances referred to at times as the cycle plays. During the 15th and 16th century, before playhouses were even a thing, these plays were performed annually in the biggest towns in Britain. They were called mystery plays because they primarily addressed the miraculous mysteries of God himself. 
throughout the whole course of the day, the whole arc of the universe from Garden of Eden all the way to Judgment Day was performed. They were organized and funded by acting guilds, which was another reason as to why they were called mystery plays. The troops themselves were called mysteries. The troops were often made up of craftsmen who would use the show to show off their wares. The performers were ordinary people with a flair for the dramatic, but they had to be damn good, otherwise they would get vegetables thrown at them. People looked forward to these performances all year round, so it was standing O or nothing. And last but not least, soccer. Like most sports, soccer actually has a pretty violent origin, kind of like lacrosse, though it was still considered a game. Soccer, aka the more accurate title, I have to say football, because football had far less rules. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. As a result, they would they got they got violent. They got really really violent. You could you could do absolutely anything in order to get the ball, save actually taking someone's life. It also wasn't strictly football, you could use any part of your body to, to get there. Wrestling, punching, kicking, scratching, tripping, you name it. If it got you a goal, fair game. But it is all fun and games until someone's eye gets poked out. In 1314, King Edward II decided it was time to put a damper on the game that was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment, but you can imagine that people didn't play by those rules either because uh, soccer still exists today somehow. Anyways guys, that was our list. Honestly, I used to play soccer when I was in middle school and I don't think the game has changed that much. Girls are violent. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet. Yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. 
It's really weird. Go home. Relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six. Nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's Knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the 
knight was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the middle ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop, let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Pope Gregory the Ninth. Pope Gregory the Ninth was the Bishop of Rome and the ruler of the Papal States from 1227 until his passing in 1241. The Papal States were a series of territories in the Italian peninsula that were under direct rule of the Pope from the 8th century all the way to 1870. It turns out that Pope Gregory the Ninth had a very strange hatred for cats. He said that black cats were actually instruments of Satan, which seems a little extreme, but then he actually went as far as to order that they be exterminated throughout Europe, which is definitely a little extreme. With this order, the Pope's followers had to oblige, and there was a drastic reduction in the cat population. But of course, this caused a disturbance to the ecosystem, and the time and the consequence of that became very evident. Because of the decline of cats, there was a sudden increase in the amount of rats, most of which may have been carrying the plague. There are a lot of historians who would argue that this war on cats may have had a huge effect on the severity of the Black Plague. That is, of course, speculation as it's pretty difficult to pinpoint who could be at fault for something like that, but it certainly is a very interesting point. This all really does, however, bring me to my next point. In our number nine spot today, we have the Black Death. I'm sure we've all heard of the Black Death at some point or another. I mean, how could we possibly ever stop talking about something like that? During the 1340s, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague that spread rapidly throughout Europe and Asia. It was called the Black Plague because of the fact that this illness would cause people's lymph nodes to become swollen and black. The Black Death was absolutely terrible and it caused a lot of agony for those who had to go through it. Symptoms included things like severe body aches, fever, vomiting, and eventual death in most cases. There was no cure for the plague, so it just continued to spread. In the end, the Black Death took the lives of hundreds of millions of people. We now all know firsthand what it is like to live through a 
pants. Like, and I certainly wouldn't sign up to do it again anytime soon, so I'm most definitely sure the times of the Black Death were some of the worst times in history. Apparently it is said that if you lived in the 1340s, there was basically a 50-50 chance that you'd survive the Black Death. And then on top of that, there's all of the other horrifying ways to die that the medieval times held. All in all, I'm kind of shocked that we're still here today. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Mongol Invasion. Being in China during the Mongol Invasion certainly was a terrifying time. I'm sure a lot of us here have heard at least some of the stories surrounding Genghis Khan, but if you haven't, let's just say that being on his bad side certainly wasn't a good thing for you. In 1205, when the Mongol invasion in China began, it was the regular citizens of China who paid the ultimate price. What was started by Genghis Khan was carried on by his son and then his grandson, which ultimately led to a 74 year long campaign that was filled with brutality and destruction. Cities and towns were destroyed, empires were brought down, and millions of completely innocent people lost their lives. It is believed that this invasion took the lives of enough people to cut the population in half from 100 20 million before to just 60 million after. Anyone living in China at this time would have had to live in the absolute fear of being killed for something that you really had nothing to do with. That would be awful and absolutely terrifying. In our number 7 spot today we have Pope Formosus and Pope Stephen VI. Pope Formosus was the ruler of the Papal States from October 6th, 891 until he passed away on April 4th, 896. After his passing, Pope Boniface VI took his place as ruler for just a few weeks before he also passed away, which then left Pope Stephen VI as the ruler from then on until his death. After this whirlwind April of 1896, things got even weirder. Before his passing, Pope Formosus had sided with Arnulf of Carinthia against Lambert of Spoleto, which was definitely not okay with Pope Stephen VI. So once Pope Stephen VI gets to the place of being the ruler, he gets the people to exhume the body of Pope Pope Formosus so that he can put him on trial. I feel like this is very gross and very unnecessary, but this really is the type of stuff that went on in the 800s. They propped the body up for trial and had a deacon answer questions for him since he obviously was unable to do that himself. They ended up finding the corpse guilty, which seems a little unfair, and they actually went as far as to strip the body of its sacred vestments, took three fingers from the right hand as they were the blessing fingers, they dressed the body in regular people clothes instead of the clothing a pope would be buried in, and then they reburied the body. If this poor man's body hadn't been through enough, it was later re-exhumed again and thrown into the river. If this story wasn't already wild enough, this whole debacle is actually what would later end up getting Pope Stephen imprisoned and then killed. All right, so I guess the other pope had his justice in the end. I don't know, man. In our number six spot today, we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him hacking up Nights, imagining that he was Saint George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was completely abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances blocked off. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Italian Renaissance dark side. Just at the tail end of the years of the medieval period, as we transitioned into the Renaissance period, began the Italian Renaissance. When we think of the Italian Renaissance period, it is known for the development and the rebirth that it caused, which makes a lot of sense considering the word renaissance means rebirth. But there is one less glamorous and slightly frightening side to this period that isn't always spoken about. Sailors who had been returning from the new world at this point brought something less than lovely back with them and that was syphilis, which spread through an entire French army. After this, the troops brought what was called the great pox to the rest of Europe. Since there was no penicillin back then, the disease spread rapidly in the 
symptoms were pretty gruesome. It would often happen that the person who had fallen ill would have the skin on their faces essentially be rotting away, which would leave large ulcers. Sometimes people's noses or lips would be pretty much gone, and it happened often that people would very sadly pass away from the disease. So basically, what we think of as a really beautiful time in Europe was both world changing, but also very scary and like, I don't know, kind of close to a zombie apocalypse. In our number four spot today, we have William the Conqueror. In 1087, William the Conqueror decided to take on an all alcohol diet. This is because he was suffering from extreme obesity and was struggling because of that fact. Because of this, he told his staff that he would only drink wine until his weight went down, but he ended up passing away less than a year later. And most of us are told that obviously this was because of the wine only diet. That's actually not true. In an astonishing turn of events, this wine only diet actually worked. Shortly after beginning his diet, he was able to ride his horse again, which was one of the main reasons he started the diet in the first place, as he was previously too heavy for the horse to carry. He actually died after falling from his horse during an expedition, which was completely unrelated to either his weight or his diet. It's entirely possible that had he not gone on this diet, he would have never ridden his horse and maybe would have lived longer? Truthfully, who knows? But I suppose in a very roundabout way, he did still kind of die from his wine only diet. In our number three spot today, we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed and during the time her son was too young to rule just yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out by using scalding hot water. Yeah. Don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it really doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. It seemed like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slang, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from. She devised a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she definitely was not okay. In our number two spot today, we have Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was a deputy to the ruler of the Mali Empire, but when the ruler went missing while on a sea voyage to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, Mansa Musa became the ruler in 1312. During his rule, European nations were really struggling due to civil wars and a lack of resources, but the Mali Empire was flourishing because of their abundance of resources like gold and salt. Under his rule, the empire grew to take up a large portion of West Africa as he conquered 24 cities and their surrounding districts. At this time, Mali was one of the top producers of gold in the entire world, which left Mansa Musa as one of the wealthiest historical figures ever. One of the most well-known events during his rule was the pilgrimage to Mecca. This journey took place from 1324 to 1325 and spanned an estimated 4,000 miles and it was the first time people outside of the empire saw just how wealthy he was. He traveled with 60,000 of his men all wearing Persian silk along with 12,000 slaves who each carried 4 pounds of gold bars and he also brought heralds who had golden staffs along with a bunch of camels and horses. This pilgrimage had a profound effect on Egypt as this huge group of people passed through. From the markets in Cairo to the royals to the impoverished people that crossed their path, Musa left Cairo littered with so much gold that it depreciated the value of the metal in Egypt and it took decades for them to recover. In our number one spot today, we have St. Marcellus's Flood. This was actually a very serious extra tropical cyclone that swept through around January 16th, 1362. This cyclone eerily matched up with the new moon and it spanned through the British Isles, the Netherlands, Northern Germany, and Denmark. Here's the thing, this storm not only lined up with the moon, but also peaked on the feast day of St. Marcellus, which is the reason it got its name, but usually people refer to this one as the second because there is another. The first St. Marcellus flood took the lives of 36,000 people as it swept through the Northern Netherlands in 1219. The second flood, however, while no one is sure the exact numbers, it is estimated that at least 250,000 people lost 
lost their lives. While there have been plenty of devastating floods in history, this one is said to be blamed on Atlantic gales and that this event goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything, we have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out to depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear Ye that is associated with the speeches of the Town Criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the Town Crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The Town Crier would often and make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye oye oye, which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number 7, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord and served as a Reeve for a one-year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number 6, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case by case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, 
Now, even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits and so they would be given a large ladle and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the middle ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the middle ages and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, cup bearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cup bearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cup bearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number 2, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the alewife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally, at number 1, Alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the Middle Ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. Number 10, duels. The Dark Ages, yeah, a lot of fun. Hope you're prepared at all times to defend your home, your family, and your honor. Good luck, you get a really sh sword as well, break a leg or two. Medieval duels were a common spectacle among men. It was a means to settle disputes and display bravery and stand like this and talk like this of course. Dressed to the nines in armor and tights, knights clashed on horseback and on foot, wielding swords, maces, and shields. I wouldn't be able to carry any of those. My arms would be shaking just trying to hold a shield. They're so heavy. They're so impossibly heavy. These intense one-on-one -on -one bouts were governed by strict rules, often overseen by heralds or nobles. Ah uh, yes, our noble Joe Rogan will oversee this bout. Now bump fists. 
Ping. Duel showcased a knight's honor with victory, bringing respect to the land. Yeah, you gotta bring that respect back to your land or else you're not coming back to that land. The outcomes impacted social standing and reputation. While duels had its risks, it was an integral part of medieval culture. So go support your medieval times. Dudes, go eat some chicken and watch an $80 show. They're pretty fun. I haven't been yet. Number nine, falconry. This one's pretty bad. So when you think of the dark ages and the jobs that were available, we often forget about this one. This one's pretty cool. Falconry was a popular pastime among noblemen during the medieval period and involved the training and hunting with birds of prey, such as falcons, but also hawks. But hawkonry doesn't sound as cool, so we gotta say falconry. Rolls off the tongue. Rolls off thy tongue. These noble hunters formed a deep bond with their feathered companions through meticulous training. Now falcons, prized for their speed, agility, and keen eyesight, these were used to pursue and capture smaller game. Falconry served as both a prestigious sport, but also a practical method of acquiring food because, well, Uber didn't exist back then. But you know what we had? A guy with a falcon that we can trust. A scary man with a falcon who'd walk around and, and grill you all day. Number eight. Tights. I don't know why I said it so angry. I'm like, tights. In medieval times, men wearing tights was a fashion trend that reflected social status and style. I got a pair of tights for running, and I'll be honest, I've never felt more like a knight in my entire life. Pull them up. Tight as a knight. Let's do this. Tights were originally worn for practical purposes, like keeping warm and having an ease of movement, of course. But tights gradually became a symbol of high fashion among the upper classes. Of course. Can we do that with sweatpants now? Can we? I feel like we're close. They accentuated the physique and showcased a man's wealth and refined taste, you can say. Sure, we'll get onto that in a little bit. Yeah, all of that in one pair of tights. How lucky were we? Tights were often brightly colored, sometimes even covered in fun patterns. They're your tights. You're living in them. Get creative. Why not? This fashion statement eventually influenced modern day styles. So next time you see a jogger, just think of the noble knight right there running to his next bout with his water belt. Number seven, cod pieces. Since we're talking about tights, let's talk about what we stuffed inside said pants said pantaloons. In medieval history, cod pieces were a peculiar fashioned accessory, trend, whatever. They were worn by men. Now these padded or stuffed coverings were designed to protect, but also emphasize the groin area. And it got really stupid. They really got carried away with it. It became a joke almost immediately. Originally serving a practical purpose, cod pieces eventually became exaggerated and decorative, symbolizing masculinity. Again, all while wearing tights, which is so funny. What a sight to see. Some guy wearing like the biggest cup you've ever seen. You're like, this isn't cool. You don't look like a really cool guy right now. Why is yours so bumpy? You should go see the local barber and get that checked out. Uh, their size and prominence varied over time with some, of course, reaching comical proportions, covering them in diamonds, studs. Like, you know, it doesn't look, that doesn't look good, man. Hashtag not hot. Get out of here. Number six, public bathing. Bathing establishments, such as a bathing house or a communal tub, these provided a place for men to gather and cleanse themselves. It was so disgusting. Now you think guys are gross now in the washroom and whatever goes on in there. Back then these gatherings were considered a social gathering where men would interact, relax, and discuss various matters. Official means, okay? Watching a guy wash his behind while he's pitching you a beard tax. You're like, okay, sure, perfect place for a meeting. Let's do it. Mind if I cover up first? Weirdo. The act of bathing back then was seen as both a physical and a spiritual purification. Ah, uh, yes. So spiritual. All this p is really transcending me. I love it. Let's go home and plan some stuff. While nudity was not unusual back in these settings, modesty was still valued just a smidgen. So individuals would often use towels or cloths for some level of privacy during these meetings. Thank God. How vulnerable is that? Like, hey, any ideas? You're like, yeah, man, I'm naked. Why don't we get dressed first? Here's my idea. Number five, arming squire. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, whatever. They're saving the damsel in distress. Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister. Spoilers, you had 10 years. But that's just what being a knight is, right? It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. I mean, first of all, this process starts when you're young. When you were seven years old, you would be given to a noble to learn for seven more years. And then at age 14, quick maths. At age 14, you would become a squire. A squire is a knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're a wee lad, but it's a job in the medieval times nonetheless. Can't complain. Also, you had no choice. Get going. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it, you know? Which buckle was it? Oh, okay, that one. Ugh, it's pretty wet and damp. Yeah, fixing up chainmail on a grown man's thigh. That ought to suck. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything 
off their armor, everything, yeah. A lot of yuck, and this was long before Dawn soap was ever a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, it gets worse and worse, doesn't it? Welcome to medieval times, moving on. Number four. Jesters. The earliest account of the fool, they go back to the 11th century. Now these fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, jumping on tables, telling jokes, farting on your aunt and uncle. It's pretty accurate. That was his job. Pretty cool. It was one of the best jobs to have, all things considered back then, this title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have. The fool's payment was also no joke. Roland Le Pature, he was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. As long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart around. Literally, he would whistle, jump around, and actually fart. And in doing so, he had acres of land. The guy was loaded, because he was just farting on people. Imagine eating beans on Christmas Day, having a nice time with your family, and then Roland jumps on the table, starts farting on your grandma, then he leaps back over to his mansion. I hate this, I hate the dark ages. Let's move on, I'm getting angry. Tell no one. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off golfing. You know, whatever you wanna do. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool, that was a bit much when it comes to assistance. So it did their assistance. We have some labor laws put in place now that I don't think we're gonna see an online job opening for a groom of the stool anytime soon. But hey, who knows? Fingers crossed. I'd love to see this again. That's pretty funny. Back in the dark ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII. Now this role was to assist the king, specifically to assist his bowel movements, his activities, his big old king <sighs> sessions. You had a box that you had to carry at all times. Now that was where um, all the magic happened in said box, the dark magic that is. And you would literally follow the king around until he needed to use this box, because porta potties weren't a thing back then, and there's no way you're gonna catch a king squatting in the woods, so now we're here. Now this is your job. In fact, you wouldn't even find that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom of the stool. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully, ideally? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gained access to every room, tons of clothes, and any bedchamber furnishings in a castle. And of course, high pay, thank God. Okay, maybe I would do it, that's not bad. Would you wipe an ass for a castle, Chris? Probably, right, not bad. You wipe your own for, you know, for no, for no castle, so that's fine. We can get you a castle. Number two, dentist, barber, surgeon combo. Get three appointments in one, all in 10 minutes or less. How lucky are you to be alive in the dark ages? Back then, dentists were not a thing. You weren't gently encouraged to floss more. You didn't have a fun chair that went back real slow, but they did have solutions. They had one solution, and that was to pull everything. Cavity, gone. Toothache, see you later. Maybe you accidentally bit a rock, you chipped a molar, eh, doesn't matter. We're gonna pull it all regardless. They would only pull your teeth out. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. I'm like, perfect, I need all of those today. What are the odds? They would use tools like forceps, pliers, and scraping instruments, all to address dental issues. However, and believe it or not, their practices lacked advanced techniques and understanding of modern dentistry. You don't say. Three jobs in one, yeah, I wonder how long that took to graduate. That's a Hefty program right there. So like, oh, it's 18 years, you're gonna love it. Yeah, no pay, it's good. And finally, number one, the beard tax. Here we go, you may have heard about the cheese tax, but have you heard about the beard tax? This is good, I would have been fine. I really tried earlier this year, couldn't do it, but I'm bald guy forever, that's cool. I would have saved money in the dark ages. My God, I would have had like savings, would have been a good, great time. The beard tax emerged in certain regions as a means of gathering revenue and enforcing social norms. Men were required to pay a tax based on the length of their beards and in some cases, even the width or the shape. They're like, we don't like that. Give us $5 right now. Lice infestations were a common problem due to the limited access of personal hygiene and sanitary practices. You know, men bathing together, pitching ideas, didn't help. However, the length and density of beards provided a natural barrier against lice. So it was believed that back then, the oils present in the beard's hair made it difficult for lice to crawl around and survive. Therefore, men often grew their beards as long as they could to prevent lice infestation. That's why Vikings had such big, long, gray beards. I take that back, I actually would have been screwed back then. I would have been so itchy. I'm itchy now, just thinking about it. I'm getting out of here, see ya. Kicking off our list at number 10, rat poison. Yeah, this one's pretty uh, pretty gross, right off the hop. During the 16th century, it was common to fill your house with arsenic trioxide to keep rats from your food supply, right? You don't want those guys hanging around, they're bringing the plague in, a little nasty. Barbara Gilbert of Leicestershire, she thought that she was grabbing flour and ended up mixing this stuff with milk. That was a really bad mistake. She 
thought she was preparing a meal for her family, when really she was about to poison them. Now, it's horrible to say, but Barbara, she took a sip, thankfully, before her family, and then she was thankfully the only person who lost their life because of this, you know, poison that they made. It's tragic, but it could have been much, much worse. Everyone dying because of a rat poison plague? That's pretty horrible. But it happened again in 1599, when Margaret Moreland thought she was giving her husband ale. Really, it was arsenic trioxide and water, aka not ale. God, that would really suck. What a horrible mishap. Number nine, famine. Back in medieval times, food supplies solely relied on good weather and proper harvests. And obviously, lack of rats definitely helps. If the seasons were dry, people, of course, starved. More often than not, common folk would survive on rations of berries, corn, and wheat. Now, the lack of food, of course, led to disease. Now, they didn't starve to death. Illnesses like tuberculosis, smallpox, typhoid, influenza, and mumps often did the trick. The Great Famine of the early 14th century was historically awful. Between 1315 and 1322, it rained for 150 days at a time. That's, uh, that's a lot of water. Western Europe was a mess. These conditions took the lives of 15% of England. Farmers couldn't plant or harvest crops, and the winters during these years were historically bad as well. Insane rainfalls and severe freezing. We're still struggling to adapt to weather changes today, but imagine the dark ages. Weather sucked every day. It was horrible. Number eight. Weather Witch. Aside from that little ice age I just referenced, what was the weather like for most of these medieval travelers? Five seasons of Game of Thrones. They talked about winter coming, but what were those winters really like? People in the 1400s believed that bad weather could be caused by the behavior of wicked people, like killers, those who sin, incest, that was a pretty bad one. Game of Thrones would have been screwed off the hop. That would have been a lot of horrible weather. Even family arguments were to blame. You talk back to your mom, next thing you know, the crops are frozen. Nice, way to go, Eric. It's on you. Now this eventually linked back to blaming witches or sorcerers who some believe could control the crops and or weather. Yeah, sorcerers controlling your crops, imagine that. The Malleus Maleficarum, published in 1486, this book straight up references a witch that would fly in the air and create storms. Yeah, with effects that took lives of animals and farmers. No thanks, I'm glad we don't have any of those floating about. We just have drones now, which are just as annoying. Number seven, Jesus take the wheel. With witches to blame for hailstorms, who do we turn to to fight the powers of evil, right? How do we get some goddamn crops back in the game? From the 14th to the 16th century, the ice pack grew around the world. Weather was changing in a drastic way, and by 1550, there had been an expansion of glaciers worldwide. Everyone thought that it was witches causing it. It's like, no, just plain old science. Back then, the general public didn't know what was happening. They didn't have Neil deGrasse Tyson explaining the phenomenon on a podcast. So people in the medieval times would perform rituals for harvesting crops in hopes that something would change. There would be special prayers, charms, beautiful services, all to ensure proper weather and fertility of the fields. Certain saints, like historical saints, they were believed to protect against harsh conditions. To protect us from the frost, we had Saint Surveys, and to shield us from the winds, we had Saint Clement. And to fight back against drought and the rains, we had the one and only Saint Elijah, or Elijah. The power of the saints and the Virgin Mary were believed to protect against storms and lightning. So that's like the medieval version of the Avengers, I guess. Tis the season. Thank you, Saint Mary. Let's keep it dry. Canada has a huge storm coming tonight, so could use some of that saint power ASAP. Number six, violence. Imagine going outside in medieval times. Is it dangerous? Is it lonely? Is it full of criminals? What's it like? What were those odds like just to get home? Street violence and brawls and taverns were as common as they are today. And like we saw a few times in Game of Thrones, peasants got a bit fed up from time to time. Yeah, I can't imagine why, huh? Vassals would revolt against their lords. This happened historically a few times. The rebellion of peasants in Flanders, this went down in 1323, and then 60 years later, England saw the peasants revolt in 1381. A lot of peasants getting fed up. Yeah, I, I would assume. I'm surprised it took that long, really. Number five, pole vaulting. The day pole vaulting was born was December 25th, 1521. It was a Christmas miracle, some would say. A laborer named Robert Baker, he was heading home from the church after a Christmas gathering. Severe floods interrupted his normal commute home, classic medieval flash floods. So Robert Baker, the quick thinker that he is, he grabbed a tall pole and he just, he just vaulted his way over this new stream that had appeared. And then he then continued home. He just carried the stick home and he was like, what have I done? What have I invented? Now at Bumblebee, we don't recommend this as a commute. Don't pole vault over things in general, unless you're a professional, don't do that. Because later on, when attempting that same stunt, Baker's pole snapped mid-leap and he ended up drowning. Yeah, the poor guy bridged the terabithia himself. You don't want anything to happen like that. That's, that's really bad. Again, in 1540, a similar case. Somebody tried to leap over a pond, but the pole wasn't 
strong enough and it broke and they drowned. Do you pull vault? If so, comment down below how scary it is to learn because I'm interested, I don't know. Number four, falling bacon. If they ever made a Final Destination movie that takes place in medieval times, that'd be an odd pitch. This would be the opening scene for sure. This is crazy. Not sure how true this is, but if so, Oh boy, my palms are sweating. It was February 12, 1543, and Elizabeth Brown was working as a servant in the household of a man named Hugh Talmash. Now, this was over in Huntingdon. Things were going swimmingly, I guess, until a tragic accident occurred. Elizabeth was the victim of a freak accident while sitting by the kitchen fire. A massive, unsliced chunk of bacon was suspended in the chimney above her to smoke over time. And that day, the rope decided to just go, and then said bacon ended up crushing her. Now, if you're smoking meats, don't put put it above or near you. That's a, that's a bizarre way to smoke meat. And also, if you're smoking meat, must be nice. That's a crazy charcuterie board. Number three, outhouse troubles. This next one really stinks, my gosh. If you're eating food right now watching this, maybe skip to number two. I won't take it personally, here we go. On June 2nd, 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan went out to his back garden to use the medieval outhouse, AKA the cesspit. Now today they're built a little differently, but back in the day it was a massive hole with a wooden rim. It wasn't pretty, it didn't smell great, it was horrible, it was made you sick. Now Duncan, the poor lad, rumor has it, he was was a little intoxicated, and Duncan, while doing his business, fell into said cesspit, leading him to suffocate to death in the worst way imaginable. Now, it sounds like a crazy way to go in medieval times, but it can happen today as well. Because in 2014, two people lost their lives trying to recover a cell phone that fell into a porta potty. Yeah, imagine that. Losing consciousness and feces is a dangerous place to do it. That's very horrible, that's a horrible way to go out. That's the worst way to go, I think. That's the worst. Number two, clocks. Yeah, if you think a piano falling on your head is insane odds, now imagine a clock. Welcome to the medieval times. The 16th century saw the beginning of clock making, and early on, these things, they were units, they were massive. Great, great grandfather clocks, these early mechanical pieces, they were made of metal and were chock full of machinery. Weight equals danger. And in 1513, a man named John Townsend was holding an iron clock, very proud, when all of a sudden it slipped from his hand and it hit the young man right next to him. William Brett, it hit him right in the forehead and the next day, Brett died of his injuries. Guy died because he got hit with a clock. What a way to go. And finally, number one, horse racing. I think it's general knowledge at this point, but standing near a racehorse equals not a good idea. Right, you heard it here first on Bumblebee. January 16th, 1540, two riders named Henry Headlam and Brian Newton, they were racing back and forth along a wall in a garden right outside of London. Casual medieval time stuff, just racing horses. Now, Newton's horse was going quite fast and Newton didn't realize that he was approaching an elm tree. Now, his head hit a branch from the tree and he broke his neck and died the next day. Now, right after this first tragic death, racing was seen as a danger to spectators and riders. More than fair. Riding a live animal at top speed yeah, that's obviously a little bit dangerous, I would assume. But then in 1534, Jane Jones was just watching, not even riding, she was watching horse racing, and then out of nowhere, a horse trampled her. Yeah, four days later, her injuries got the best of her. So if you're watching any live horse racing this afternoon, I don't know, have some distance maybe. Move up a couple of seats in the stands. Horse racing is big in uh, Ontario for some reason. I don't know, we have like one big one, constantly busy. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters. Those are some horrible ways to go in medieval times. I'll probably be back with a part two because you know how it is back in the dark ages. It's pretty gross, pretty dirty, a lot of rats, a lot of ways to die. Number 10, pressure to perform. In the middle ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage right. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now, the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. 
Number nine, Beastly Justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly Justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a night and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand and it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair, they're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chainmail. You know how heavy chainmail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chainmail. My knees would buckle. No thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. Is it important 
role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats. I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or, you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him. So he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like, you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, huh, fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh. many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. And this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe as it were. So. Not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The Gong Farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible. They're not really a thing. They didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often 
pile up within the castle walls, and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The rat trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming. So maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey, our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck piles of it just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad. It was all bad. Hashtag all bad.